Welcome back to The Glass Eye. Uh, and thank you for watching the short doc, Billy the Magician. This video is gonna be about how I planned it, shot it, and edited the video based on some of your questions and DMs that I got since that video was posted last week. And if you haven't watched it, then make sure you go and watch that first. Without further ado, let's get into it. So I first met Billy when we were shooting the Red Komodo video with Pete. Now one of the most important things with videos, uh, it seems pretty straightforward, but it's, sometimes it isn't, is don't say it, show it. It was really important to show his craftsmanship, to show the finished product. And for that, we needed to find a car that was finished that he'd worked on. And that's where Trevor came in the picture. Trevor was a way of kind of introducing us to Billy through the work that he did on his car. So that's gonna be something crucial for the video is to represent the finished product, show Billy working on current projects, and then to show a human side of Billy. And that's that's where his son came in. And then to kind of tie everything back together at the end, bringing Trevor and Billy and Pete all together at the end was food, which is often a thing that brings people together. And then in post, it's a matter of taking those elements and then kind of arranging them in a way that just helps tell the story. As the title suggests, I shot this on the Sony FX3. Now this is my own camera, it's not a review unit. I paid for this, I've had it for about six months. I make sure you're subscribed because the next video will be a full review of the camera, the six month overview of what it's been like to shoot with it for clients, for myself, for YouTube, etc. When you're creating videos for YouTube, you have to split your brain into like a million pieces. You are coming up with ideas and you're planning those ideas and you're also coordinating all the shooters, also the lighting off. guy and the audio guy and you get the idea. Within each one of those categories, there's a bunch of subtasks. Like if you're doing the camera, then you have to rig it up with a follow focus and a map box. And it's, it's almost this mission to create the best quality work with as little gear as possible, provided that the quality meets a certain threshold. So my camera package is like super simple. It's just a camera, a 24 to 70, an ND filter, and a black pro mist quarter strength. And that's it. As far as shooting the video, again, the approach was to be simple. So I, pretty much all of it was handheld with the exception of some gimbal shots when we were driving. Even the stuff where we get the, the wheel of the car while we were driving, I was thinking of like rigging the FX3 to the side of the car. But then I'm like, you know what? I could just hold it. I mean, it's got Ibis and I think a little bit of shake is actually what add to the sense of action and speed. So my general approach to lighting these YouTube videos and most videos that are dock style is to take whatever the available light is and the available ambient kind of environment and then supplement it with a little bit of my own as opposed to kind of building the lighting from a ground up thing where you're lighting every component of the scene. I used to use a Quasar tube, a four foot Quasar tube, but now I bought myself one of these Pavel tubes right here actually. I love this thing just because of the convenience. Again, it goes back to that ethos of slimming down, making things simpler, battery powered, wireless, tiny package. It makes all the difference when you're making these kind of videos. The lighting of the Trevor interview was pretty straightforward. I was actually gonna use the Pavo tube for the main light, but then there was this window on the side of the garage and uh, it was too bright, so we covered a bunch of the windows, but then the rest of it, it was like this nice soft light coming from the window. It's like, hey, you don't have to work hard to do the lighting. If it already looks good, then just use it. And for audio, I used the video mic NTG for most of it. It was just sitting on top of the camera, and then it was on a boom pole for any of the interview scenes. Now, whenever you're shooting cars, the sound of the car is pretty integral to the, you know, sort of capturing the experience of that car and the emotions of that car. So you want to record the audio on the car, but the thing is, rigging a car up properly for audio is pretty cumbersome as well. And I need to simplify that process. The idea is we've got magnets. Ow, oh, bitch. They're strong magnets. So I've been using these rig wheels, little magnets connected to a Rode Wireless Go To mic, and then just trying different spots on the car. And one of the biggest challenges with cars is that you're gonna end up clipping audio. It's really easy to clip audio, especially when they're revving high. So what you do is you stick the mic somewhere and then go and listen. It's not clipping anymore. While they rev the engine just to see like, is it clipping, is it not? And a lot of times it is. So then you gotta move the mic and then once you find a good spot, then you go for a drive and you do a, you know some big pulls, you gear up, you downshift, you do a bunch of different maneuvers and then you can take that audio and then match it up to the driving footage that you captured separately. So for the first time ever, I tried editing and grading in the DaVinci wide gamut color space. It's like a color managed system and it's, it's different. So in the beginning it was, it was uncomfortable because all my sort of presets and looks and whatever were not, were just, were not translating. But once you start to spend a little time with it, you start to see that it is very capable because DaVinci wide gamut is like a huge color space. It's like bigger than HDR. Any color space can fit within the DaVinci wide gamut. I guess one way to think about it is like 
Imagine you are, your colors are your ingredients and you're baking in a bowl. And so you, you're mixing your colors in a bowl. But imagine that the bowl is the exact size of your ingredients. So you can still mix stuff, but it's much easier to spill, which in this case would be like clipping your highlights or your shadows. But working in a wide gamut is like having a really big bowl and you put your colors in there and you can mix. And it doesn't mean you can't spill. You can still spill it, but it's much harder. And then afterwards, you can pour that into the appropriate size bowl that you want to finish with. And that appropriate size bowl would be whatever color space you want to deliver your project in. So it's not about using wide gamut if you want to just do HDR work. You, you can have a standard dynamic range deliverable, but still work in the DaVinci wide gamut. Once you're grading, you'll see that the roll off in both the shadows and the highlights is much more smooth and gradual and just kind of more natural looking. So if you haven't tried it, if you use DaVinci and you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. Watch some videos online. Maybe I'll do one. I don't know. If you want to see it, let me know. And I think you'll be surprised once you get a hang of it, how powerful it really is. Okay, don't skip this part. This is the thank yous. And I, I gotta give a shout out to these people. Pete, first of all, for putting all the pieces together. He, he's just like the coordinator and the facilitator from Flat Six Classics. I feel like we've done many videos together. We'll probably do many more. And Trevor for being involved and agreeing to be interviewed and coming out several days to shoot. Andrew for shooting some BTS. Actually, Pete also shot some BTS. Thank you to Happy Day Restaurant. Thank you to Mike for hooking that up. Of course, the biggest thanks goes to Billy and his son Oscar for being a part of the video and agreeing to be a subject in the video. Okay, now I'm done.